But if you have seen it, especially in your younger years, then you, my friend, are whom I'm really speaking to here. If you, like me, first watched this show in a younger life, then I encourage you to return to it with everything you know now, and watch as the show transforms into something else entirely. I turned 40 years old this year, and I think it was that realization that made me want to do this video in the first place. I'm turning 40, and just like Godot from Berserk, who, in paraphrase, said that before he knew it was happening while trying to forge the best weapons, he became an old man, I started making YouTube videos back in 2012 at the age of 28, and before I knew it, I turned 40. And that's something that's been sitting with me a whole lot over the last six months. I've been watching colleagues, friends, and professional acquaintances either leaving the platform, being cancelled, or falling into retirement. And I'm listening to so many people who started watching me in their teens, who now have children of their own, talking about how it's an end of an era. That mixed with the now complicated relationship I have with my identity as being the quote Japanese culture guy and a general plateauing in my career over the last three years or so, I've been questioning my own identity as of late. I guess you could say this is my midlife crisis for as little of a solid definition as that word has. And lordy, not only has the realization that I'm turning 40 been sitting with me, it's been laying with me. I've never believed my folks when they said that a good bed is a dang near requirement to aging well, but I'm starting to finally understand. It wasn't too long ago that I was sleeping on a Japanese futon on the floor and being more than content, but now? <laughs> oh, my lower back ain't forgiving me for that one. Uh, that's why when Helix Leap reached out to do a sponsorship with me, I was like, heck yeah. I'm getting older, and this video is partially about that, and I know a good portion of all of you, my regular viewers, are of the demographic age that you're starting to complain about back pain. So listen up. One thing that I very much appreciate that Helix does is it gives you a series of questions about sleep positioning habits, comfort, temperature, and most importantly, where, if anywhere, do you have body pains? I actually find that part to be supremely critical. And after my own brief quiz, I was suggested the Helix Midnight Mattress with Glacial Tex and Lux Slayer. Quite a mouthful, huh? But basically it means a bed that's middle ground firm with built-in cooling and the extra support layer that this bed has. I don't know about you, but sleeping hot just gives me nightmares, so that's super important. But what I wasn't expecting was how this thing was delivered. It's queen-size bed, and you'd figure it'd be huge, but the box itself was pretty compact when I saw it on my doorstep. And I soon figured out why. The whole mattress and two pillows that I ordered were in one big vacuum sealed bag, which makes it really easy to set up. You just pull it out and let it go. And once you open that bag up, man, this thing just puffs. Audibly puffs. It is so wild to see. And surprisingly, I actually felt like it weighed less than my previous mattress did, despite being the same size. And two hours later, Aki and I hit that thing and I just sank into it. But in a good way. I'm guessing it was that extra Lux Layer puff that ended up being the right stuff. And my first night with it, well, it's kind of weird to explain. Normally, I need a solid 7 to 8 hours in order to wake up feeling right, but that first night, I only was out for about 5. And I woke up early feeling like I was ready to go, so for those 5, I was out in deep sleep. And honestly, I'd rather have better, harder, deeper sleep than middling sleep that takes a longer amount of time for me to get rested. So. I don't know, man. Whatever algorithm they have in that sleep quiz to fix you up with the right bed is obviously doing something right. And with that, Helix comes highly recommended by me. There's a 100 night sleep trial to make sure that the mattress you get is absolutely the way you need it, and each mattress comes with a 10 year warranty. Plus, if you need it, there's a lot of financing options as well. But right out the gate, Helix is still doing their 4th of July special that has their Lux and Elite mattresses plus two free pillows at 30% off. Or you could simply take a flat 25% off the entire store for a limited time. So if you've been wanting to throw out your old topper and sink yourself into something new that is catered to your specific needs, check out my link in the description and give that sleep test a whirl. If you are over 30 years old, I cannot recommend enough getting something like this to sleep on. Your back will thank you. But anyway, let me get back to Cowboy Bebop and my so-called midlife crisis. It's true that the older you get, the faster time flies, and the time between 2012 and 2019 in hindsight feels like a blink of an eye. But the time between 2020 and now has been absolutely bonkers. We all know that time moves faster online, but in three years, what felt like should have happened over a decade happened in less than a third of that time. 
Now there are so many ways to do this content creation hustle, with so many people making it happen, that I look back at what I've done and I can't help but feel like... I'm a little bit antiquated. Like, I've had and still have this massive dream of moving to Japan to continue making videos from that geographical position and everything that I could do with it. I had tons of ideas for series and shows and shorts, I mean, you name it, I had an idea for it. But these days, there are so many other content creators living in Japan, trying to leave their mark on their preferred platforms by doing everything from stereotypical konbini food reviews to, quote, the most beautiful place in Japan you could ever visit, I feel like the whole thing's just kind of a little overdone. And I admit that sometimes I feel like if I tried to put my hat in the ring in that kind of way, it would just be more to a sea of sound that is getting almost incomprehensible at this point. And as I sat there wondering if my career really had peaked and asking myself if there's little more to try to push for, I started going back and re-watching some of the old YouTube videos and content creators that inspired me over the last decade. And that's when I filled back on one particular video done by the final gamer himself entitled Why You Should Watch Cowboy Bebop, and decided to take Super Eye Patch Wolf's challenge that he issued well, seven years ago. But a couple of caveats though before I can get to the meat of this thing. I am not going to recap the entirety of the show, and I'm also going to be spoiling massive parts of it as need be. There's a dozen other videos out there on YouTube that have already done that, and I really don't feel like wasting my time or yours on that. Besides, if you haven't seen the show, you absolutely should. Regardless, if you're here, it's likely because you, like me, were entranced by the show during the late nights of your teenage years on Adult Swim. Side note, I, I can't help but smile at the bit of irony that this show released in the States at about the same time I was turning 17. Nearly to the day. Uh, I also really can't give a damn about what the intended message of the show was supposed to be, nor do I really care about what other people believe it to be. Like all good art, it's subjective and can even change with time. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of this video. So do not expect this video to be the pinnacle explanation of what this show is supposed to be. The only thing I'm doing in this video is trying to explain why we need another Cowboy Bebop. Cowboy Bebop is one of those rare anime that continues to fascinate me, in that it feels like it's one of the few anime out there over the last 30 years that relies on nothing but its own strengths to stand out and be memorable. This is a show completely absent of typical anime tropes. Granted, I'll concede the notion that 80s and 90s anime were completely oversaturated in sci-fi, and there are one or two scenes with Faye that are 100% rude in fan service. But Cowboy Bebop stands above a lot of other anime because it's a shining example of something that I've believed anime to be best at more than any other artistic medium, portraying and personifying the human condition. And man does it do that in spades! From the side characters having their own everyday lives to the complex origins of our main characters Spike, Chet, Faye, and Edward, to even the background extras that you only see for a moment before they're never seen again in the series. This show is a living world and its creators absolutely went out of their way to show that in detail. So when I was in my late teens, this was the super mature, super real, super intense narrative that I thought that I needed after discovering the highly enjoyable yet hyper absurd shonen series that had already made its way to the US some 5 years prior. Being a 13 year old who loved Dragon Ball Z to a 17 year old who loved Cowboy Bebop. But man, that was 23 years ago. I'm a completely different person now. When I first saw the show in my late teens, my mind was constantly swimming with what could be in my life, not what was. College was right around the corner, there was the JET program, which became my muse in which I studied, and even after JET, Japan, its culture, and me identifying as a teacher revolving around it became my identity for almost 20 years. Now though, it feels like I'm kinda rooted where I am without too much going on. There are some days I feel like the most exciting parts of my life have come and gone. Like, back then, Japan was such a strange, beautiful, and often confusing place that kept my fascination in wonder, but now? Going to Japan just feels like a part of everyday life. Not bad mind, just ordinary. Like, during my trip in 2023, when the country finally reopened, it honestly felt like nothing had changed except for a few places were closed. Tokyo was relatively the same, Mie was relatively the same, and while it was amazing to see my old friends again and exploring a part of Japan that I had never been to, it just felt... normal. And that directly ties to my YouTube career. It's like, it's still there, it still has a loving fan and viewer base, and I still enjoy doing it, and it's still lucrative enough to continue doing it. 
But especially after COVID, I can't escape feelings of plateauing into mediocrity? That's not the right word. Normality? I guess that's a little better. But, but it's like, sometimes I feel like the big wild days of my life are over and I'm just doing this job now with no real surprises. Like my own personal anime arc is complete, yet my story has to keep going because my life has to keep going. And that's the tricky thing about anime, or heck, general storytelling. These stories typically begin at the start of the main character's arc and ends with the ending of that character's arc. But that's the one thing that makes Cowboy Bebop stand out from every other anime show. The thing about all the main characters here is that they're pretty much arced out. I mean, they all get a bit of epilogue and a bit more closure as the series goes on, but their most definitive parts of their lives are pretty much over and complete. Spike's already faked his death so he could get out of the Red Dragon Syndicate, Jet retired from his police job with the ISSP after being backstabbed by corruption on the Force, and Faye had already gotten taken for all she's worth in terms of money as well as trust, and yeah, there's Radical Edward in contrast who hasn't been completely arced out. In fact, she's probably not even started her own definitive arc yet by the time she leaves the Bebop. So narratively, I see her as kind of a control group for the others to reflect off of. My point in all this is that this is an incredibly well-known anime with popularity spanning multiple decades at this point, yet it's a story about characters who have already had the most important parts of their journey happen, who are just kinda now... existing. Except they're absolutely not! They're still having insane goofy adventures! Asteroid Blue, Stray Dog Strut, Gateway Shuffle, Sympathy for the Devil, Heavy Metal Queen, Toys in the Attic, Bohemian Rhapsody, Mushroom Samba, Pierre Le Frickin' Foo? This is kind of the weird thing about this anime. The characters themselves are arced out, that much is obvious, but they still go on these insane side adventures that keep falling into their lap, despite the excitement and impact that they leave on their lives lasting little longer than the time they take place in. Now, I hear a lot of other YouTubers talk about how this series is themed around the concept of baggage, like, you're gonna carry that weight, so to speak. And many still say, like I've been doing right now, that this is a story about people dealing with the fact that they have to continue to exist despite all the events that have essentially peaked in their lives being long over. Granted, most of those peaks were pretty terrible, but those moments were still their peak. And yet, we have episode after episode that has these arced out characters going on miscellaneous, high-flying adventures that almost cost them their lives from time to time. So, how is this show both one and the other? Well, that's where I think the show's magic lies and why I feel like we absolutely need another one. The thing about life is that at one point or another, you're gonna have to come to grips with the idea that the most exciting parts of it that defined who you are, for better or worse, are over. As I look at 40 on the horizon and learn that there's really nothing exciting about getting older, I'm realizing that the biggest, most consistently wild parts of my life are probably behind me. The back-to-back -back cons and content creator events that had me wake up at 6am and go to bed at 2am, the weeks, months, and years of living in Japan and feeling that each one of those days was an extreme of good or bad, the colossal explosion of popularity that developed my online identity through my channel and other channels like working with Game Theory, those days are mostly over. That isn't to say they didn't drastically impact my life to form me into the person that I am now, much in the way that Jet, Spike, and Faye had their current outlooks on life be dictated by their past. My own past has formed me into who I am now, and I'm happy about that, but the really exciting big stuff? I think it's mostly done. Except it's not done! I've started a completely different channel involving the most right-hand turn I think I ever could have in my career, seeing me going from focusing on Japan and world culture to a tabletop game involving stupid green mushroom people with too many guns and overexcitement for war. Is it gonna be as successful as my time with game theory and skyrocket me into a brand new life of cons, events, and extreme content creation? Not likely, but it's something. It's a new identity, and in a way, a new kind of life. And that's my point. This is the critical thing about life that I've learned going back and watching through Cowboy Bebop. We as a sentient species will have to come to terms one day that the most impactful things that developed us as individuals will be behind us. Whether or not you think it's a youthful prime, a perfect job, the golden years, or some of the most traumatic crap you've ever had to experience in life and now require therapy for, we are all going to have to come to terms with that. And in many of our cases, some of those most impactful moments that develop us as humans 
are not going to be good. Life is going to screw us. Life is going to screw you. It's going to screw me. We're going to get hurt. We're going to lose people. We're going to be in trouble. And in any of those cases, whether they be good or bad, it's going to be what you do going forward in life after they're done that will make or break the rest of your life. And aside from the episodes that are more outlandish, every story of every episode in Cowboy Bebop asks its main and supporting cast a simple question. What do you do with your life once the most defining things in it are over? Like, how do you go on living? What choices do you make? Seriously, I challenge you to go back through every single episode that involves any sort of established character and tell me that their whole story doesn't revolve around them dealing with the fact that the most important points of their lives, whether they be good or bad, are over and they have to deal with the fact that they have to continue existing. Some of them allow themselves to be consumed with revenge, some of them find a little bit better of a life, and some find the true zen of existence by not allowing any part of their lives to dictate who they become, thus they never feel like they're being forced to live on despite their personal arcs being over. Because they never end. And while the first draft of this video had me spending an extra 20 minutes going over every example, I think the best way to summarize this thesis is to look at our three main leads, Spike, Jet, and Faye. How do they answer the question of what do you do with your life once the most defining things in it are over? Jet, I think, answers that question the best way out of the three. Despite being abandoned by Alyssa and betrayed by his partner Fatty River, he never let those defining moments of his life dictate what he did after his prime. He makes a new life for himself as a bounty hunter. He takes in individuals like Spike Fay, Ed, and Ayn and gives them a new life. He's the very first to speak up when someone like Spike allows their past to dictate the life they now have. Jit symbolizes the healthy response to a midlife crisis by allowing himself the freedom to have another life. Don't get me wrong, he's got his own weight to carry, but he doesn't let it consume him. Faye is more of a middle ground. She spends the majority of the series trying to figure out the person that she was before her defining moment, being put into cryo after falling prey to an illness medicine couldn't cure at the time and racking up a titanic debt with Big Pharma. Boy, ain't that just freaking familiar. It's very obvious that that consumes her, but right up to the point she remembers who she is, she discovers that the only place she really has is the bebop with Jet and Spike. It took her the entire show for her to realize it, but she did finally figure out that letting go of her past and accept the life that she has now is the best way to go. One that can have its own points of excitement, but she never could go back to the person she was. Spike, despite being the most charismatic character of the show, is the greatest example of being unable to move past the most influential part in one's life. Spike actively tries to chase after it any chance that he gets, attempts to defeat it, but inevitably permanently loses the past that he's trying to find again, and then promptly dies for it. Both Jet and Faye try to convince him that this isn't who he was. His life before was done and he needed to make peace with that. But Spike, being the moron that I now believe him to be, simply says, I'm not going there to die. I'm going to find out if I'm really alive. I have to do it, Faye. Man, when I was 17, I thought this line was peak. It was a time in my life when I was finally ready to start living. I, like many people in their late teens, romanticize Spike as this individual who chose life over stagnation. And now as I turn 40, I think Spike is the biggest idiot out of the three. The one who not once, not twice, but three times openly abandons their new life, a good life, to try and chase after an old life, an old peak, and something that could never be obtained again. This is why we need another Cowboy Bebop. Not a continuation of the story and absolutely not a remake of it, but an anime that completely revolves around these concepts. The first generation of weebs and otaku are hitting their middle age now, and I, as well as many others, just can't relate to anime much anymore. By its nature, anime revolves around the concept of youth because it's what Japan fascinates and fantasizes about. There is very little anime about working age folk out there because working age in Japan is not pleasant. It's a tedious, grinding, soul-crushing, death-inducing existence. In most cases, anime that revolves around being middle or at least working age tends to point out how awful it is and either has the main character utterly removed from it via something like an isekai where they just go back to their prime, or it hyper fantasizes home life for its working age viewers to superimpose themselves on. But Cowboy Bebop does the complete opposite of all of that. 
It's an anime that utterly revolves around the idea of people getting older, people having their peak, and then asking the question of, what the heck are you gonna do now? And it answers that question with all its main and side characters. It's an anime that I needed, and I feel like tens if not hundreds of thousands of other people desperately need it right now. Because this show does explore and warn the dangers of living in the past, and it also subtly explores the answer to the conundrum of the midlife crisis. For example, throughout the entire show, there's this reoccurring joke of three old men, Antonio, Carlos, and Jobum. And these guys are freaking everywhere! They appear from a Tijuana asteroid to a high-class casino to an outlier slum made of hyperspace gate debris. These three old, somewhat senile old men really get around. You don't see it, but you know these three old-timers are having their own insane adventures despite being well past their prime and their developmental peak. Then there's individuals like Chessmaster Hex, who was wronged in probably one of the worst ways possible in the show, but he eventually moved past all of the negative things that impacted his development the most and said, screw it, I'm just gonna focus on my first love of chess. Oh, and speaking of character who straight up say, screw it, how about Edward's father, Apple Deli? This is a man whose life and experiences are so fluid that despite being 42 years old, there is nothing in his life that has defined him, for better or for worse. I mean, he straight up forgot that he left Edward at a daycare center at one point. But this is a man in his early 40s who is completely undeterred with his past and wishes only to focus on the one thing that he cares about right now mapping the topography of the ever-changing Earth. And he does that despite how futile that is considering constant asteroids from the broken moon keep terraforming the planet. This guy, in his 40s, is unshaking. And Andy, oh, then there's Andy. This guy gets it. This guy is the answer to the question that the entire anime has been asking. This is a man who is truly free, completely undefined by any particular moment of his past or even present, and allows only the whims of his hyperfixations to come through. Granted, he's also a bougie idiot who has more money than he knows what to do with, and is terrible at the thing that he hyperfixates with half the time, but that's kind of the point. This is a man who has let nothing in his past affect who he is, not even his recent past. Because after his defeat at the hands of Spike, Andy sheds his hyperfixation with cowboys and moves on to a hyperfixation with samurai. Done bad an eyelash at the identity he left behind. He just screams out, call me Musashi, and rides off into the sunset, putting his entire heart into what he loves despite it being the polar opposite of what he once was. Real talk? Andy spoke to me way harder in a personal level than any other character, because while Andy will switch his hyperfixations that make him happy at the drop of a hat, I feel like I've been a coward to dive into mine, i.e. the fighty fungus people. I'm actually jealous that Andy has the balls to just go all in whatever floats his fancy. That is true freedom. Cowboy Bebop is a story about characters whose arcs or even the primes of their lives have already happened. Prime not being limited to age, but circumstance. The show is about how their primes have affected them as they are now, but have to continue existing. There's a feeling of entropy, as if the characters save Ed are just existing, trying to live despite the trauma and pain that the world has put on them. And as I watch this as I turn 40 years old, I feel like it's a completely different show, because I also feel like that my big arc of my life is over. Like, life just dumps on you. It's dumped on all the main characters, side characters, and even the antagonists, but they still have to exist. Life keeps going after you think you peak, you can either do it by letting go and moving on with other things in life that you enjoy, things that you find that just give you a spark back again, or you can hold on too tight and let it consume you till your actual death. Hell, the Earth is past its prime, but people are still charting topographic developments of rock showers from the moon. It's like, no matter how old you are, there's still things to do. And the thing is, everyone's still having experiences, adventures, and making new adversaries in the meantime. Just because life isn't its most bombastic doesn't mean that it has nothing left to give. That's something that I also realized as I turned 40. Life isn't over. Life won't let it be over. There are always more problems, more solutions, more sadness, more joy, more successes, and more failures. There is still more to be done and more to be had. We in the anime community need more of this. All of this. Anime is at its best when it explores and personifies the human condition, right? I mean, that's what I said at the beginning of the video. 
Well, a lot of otaku now are living the midlife aspect of the human condition, and we need more than just one 23-year-old anime to help get us through it. Most anime are geared towards an audience that seem to only create fantasies for us to superimpose onto. I think we need more than that, now more than ever. We need more anime that zeroes in on the question of identity and how we trap ourselves in it. We need more anime that explores the idea that we are more than our past, that if we try to chase after what we believe to be the best years of our lives, it could literally kill us. We need more anime that shows us not to be afraid of a new identity, of a new life. We need another Cowboy Bebop. Thanks for watching, everyone, and a big thank you to my patrons who voted on this topic. I know it made me sound like a confused old man at times, but doing this video feels incredibly healthy for me. It helps me get a better perspective on things, you know? And speaking of healthy, a big thank you to Helix for sponsoring this one. I never promote anything I don't personally think is worthwhile, and a good night's sleep with a bed catered to what I need? Yeah, that is absolutely worth its weight in gold. As far as what I'm cooking up here next, there are two games that have dropped that have been on my cultural radar for a while now. Bo, Path of the Teal Lotus, and Capcom's Kunitsugami. Both are just oozing with parts of Japan that I love, and both thickly veiled in inspiration culture. So I might just have to give those two a crack as soon as I can. But until next time everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.